Hey gang, welcome back. Welcome to AMA number nine. Is this number nine? This is number nine. Uh, Y'all have been sending a lot of questions lately, uh, which is awesome. So today, since most of the questions actually don't, uh, there's no need for me to have a drum set, I'm gonna do this one from the comfort of my home. Um, which is gonna be great for me. So anyways, I'm also gonna try to be a little less long-winded about things, so maybe we'll be able to get through more questions instead of me pontificating uh, ad nauseum on each, including this introduction. So let's get into it. Number one, hey JP, please tell me the difference between 6-8 grooves and 4-4 triplet halftime grooves. I know they have a different feel, but I noticed that the same beat you can write in 6-8 and 4-4 in triplets. And, uh, Oleg here from Russia, uh, attached an image of what he was talking about. This is a great question, um, and super it's super helpful to understand the difference. This might seem like something where I could use a drum set, but the, the thing is I need you to hear me counting, so I actually can't do this at a kit, really. Um, so here's the image, Psh, beat one, beat two. It is It will sound the same if without any counting, but let me, it's easiest to first demonstrate the difference in this, uh, between these two, and then try to find the words to explain it. So the top example, we're in 6A. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One and two and three and four, five and six. One and two and three and four, five and six. Okay, so we've got six groups of two. One, two, 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 one, two. The other one, we're thinking instead of six groups of two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, we're thinking four groups of three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So now let me play play the second one. Uh, while keeping with my right hand the the four four time now, so so. Even though, so if I'm not keeping time, this should sound exactly the same, but this is a really important uh, differentiation, is that the word? <laughs> this is very important to differentiate for the people you're playing with and also for you because those two things, six, eight, got to, and one, two, three, one, two, three, got, are totally different feels. They're, we're talking about different time signatures. So if you bring in a thing, if you, for example, are feeling it in four, four, and you bring it in written in 6-8 and expect your bandmates to be able to play it with you, especially the first time, they're going to be very confused. And they might even just start hearing this song in a totally different time, which can happen. And then after a while you're like, something's weird here. And that might be it. So well, let me switch between the two and it'll really highlight the difference here. So pay attention to my right hand because that's gonna be marking whether it's six notes or four notes. Six notes of two or four notes of three. They equal the same amount, which is why it fits in the same bar, and that it is actually the same exact pattern of notes. Um, but the context within which it is placed is really very important. So I'll do the six, eight, four, four, six, eight, four, four. So one, two, three, four, five, six, do 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 So, very good question, Oleg. Uh, that's very cool to, cl to uh, clear up. Both those time signatures, 6 8 and triplet straight time, um, sorry, triplet 4 4, uh, those are a couple of my favorite things to play on. There's so much room to explore in both of them, and you can, I would advise, if you're interested in that thing, to to do triplet 6 8 as well. 1 and a 2 and a 3 and a 4 and a 5 and a 6 and a 1 and a 2 and a 3 and a 4 and a 5 and a 6 and a 
Because then you're dealing with how many notes? Six times three, 18 notes in the measure. Um, it's just cool. My friend the other day, uh, we were talking about trip. We, we were talking about triplets. It makes it sound pretty nerdy, but we were. Um, I forget how he worded it, but it's basically like there's two upbeats. Yeah, that's what it was. I was always like, I'm trying to explain to people that like triplets are kind of the shit. There's like just 50% more notes. And he's like, yeah, there's two upbeats instead of one. And I was like, whoa, man, that's it. So, you know, that's pretty heavy stuff for the AMA. But yeah, two upbeats, pretty big deal. Seriously, triplets are cool. All right, question number two. Your lessons are great, but I always... I always cannot follow your fast beats. Could you have sheet music for reference? Yes, actually, this is a timely question because I, as you might have seen recently, I posted looking for someone to transcribe um, to do some transcription work, and that was for the site. So I'm a little crunched for time in general lately. Um, so I have found someone uh, to make way more transcriptions and PDFs. So I'm hoping to level up the site here slightly by providing much more written material because I keep preaching that it is important to understand how how drum notation is written. And once if you can just see it every day and you see what it is and you're hearing me play it on the video and you're playing it, these connections just start to happen and then all of a sudden you'll know how to read music. You won't really have like tried to learn how to read music, um, but hopefully you'll have a pretty good understanding of it. Uh, soon. So, yep, if, unless it doesn't make sense for the video, like there's no transcriptions in this video, um, there will be transcriptions and as often as possible PDFs from now on. So, yay for that. And take, do look at them because like I said, this is re just looking at them and hearing me play it is going to do a lot to solve the mystery of drum reading for you. Like you don't have to just, you don't have to set aside six months of your life and be like, now I'm going to learn to read. Just start looking at drum notation whenever you watch a video, whenever you practice. Um, and that'll take you, that'll take you three quarters of the way there. Question three. Hello. What are your goals slash New Year's resolutions for 2019? I'm a little late answering this because it's mid-February. It's late February. But, um... I'll, I'll t I want to talk about one, and this year I don't have like super specific goals, New Year's resolutions, but there's one that I have been keeping in mind sort of as a mantra. It might be, it'll either be disappointing because it's not really drum related, or it'll be like refreshing because it's not drum related. Um, so it is, it's this sort of, I don't even remember what book it was in, but it, it just sort of passed by. It was not even a, an important like a focal point of whatever I was reading. But it, some character had said, do not be afraid of life. And I just, that just made me pause and stuck with me. And this was probably three months ago now. And I, that so I started like just thinking on that more. And I realized how often there is some level of anxiety in even the most trivial decisions that I need to make in a day, right? You know, from big deal things to like, uh, you know, performing, going to practice, to the smallest things, like deciding what I'm gonna wear in a day, or seeing someone I know in the neighborhood and just stopping to say what's up, or versus trying to like, uh, maybe kind of avoid them. So I just realized or when you, when you need to call someone, that's the worst. It's like, it's on your to-do list, like, call this guy and talk to him about the thing. Like, call the guy to fix the tiles in the kitchen or something. Those things, they're, they're really so dumb. But I find that there's this subtle anxiety. And it's not like crippling, it's not keeping me from living my life. But it's keeping me from living my life more f just joyfully, right? There's just this subtle fear or anxiety behind a lot of my moves. And... It's almost like the when I noticed it, I like couldn't stop noticing. You become hypersensitive to it, where you'll be doing something that you enjoy doing, that's fun. You're meeting up with the guys, or going to play drums, or have a show, or whatever, and just be super hyper aware of uh, this anxiety that sort of uh, 
running static beneath the surface. So that has been the thing I've been trying to, uh, yeah, this do not be afraid of life has sort of been, sort of, I don't know, I don't usually, I don't think of the word mantra, but it's sort of a repeating something on my mind, even for months now. Whereas as I go through my day and I face the tasks that I need to face, be they, be they very scary big things or very small little things, um, I'm trying to always go into them with a reminder. Do not be afraid of life. This is fun. Life's kind of like a game. And life's supposed to be fun. And it's pretty much as fun as you make it. So there's that. And then sort of alongside that is this, uh, this sort of metaphor from... This guy named Sam Harris that I, I listen to his podcast every now and then. He had a really nice metaphor. He's got a meditation app. He's very like a Zen kind of guy. And he was like, no one would play a video game if the video game, there was just no challenge. You just walk around. You can't die. You can't win. You never get challenged with anything. Um, it's sort of a, it's a metaphor for life and that when you wake up, you're never not going to encounter some amount of challenge in your day. And you wouldn't really want to live a life where you're not encountering challenge because those challenges are the things that make you grow, make life exciting, that you look back on and you're proud of. Um, it, life's just kind of one problem after the next and not in a bad way, but in sort of like if you look at it with the right eyes, like it's a game, it's sort of like fun way. Well, like I'm going to wake up and what problems will I solve today? I'm going to solve them either way. And this is where the other half of it ties in. If I'm going to do them either way, why do I need to do them with this anxiety? Why not just do them? A acknowledge the anxiety, let it subside, and realize that the stakes are very low. The stakes are very low for most things that cause that subtle anxiety. So, yeah, that's kind of my main New Year's resolution. And it's, it, it's like a subtle mind shift, but it's helping me a lot to... Just enjoy the little things I need to do in a day. This is making life more enjoyable. From everything to even doing this AMA. You know, I still get, even though I've made, you know, 600 videos or something at this point, I still get nervous when I do them. But now I see that as like, oh, well, they've all been fine. At least passable. <laughs> um, this one won't be any different. And there's the stakes. Again, the stakes are so low. And I love doing this once I start doing it. So all these things kind of line up in my mind and I say, do not be afraid of life. Be excited for it. So, I'm trying to reframe some things in my in my psyche, and I think it's uh, having a nice, subtle, positive effect. Number four, I'm having trouble staying focused during some exercises. I know I need to do them, but I don't want to do them. I'm sure we can all sympathize with this person. How do you manage to really shut down distractions, especially internal distractions, like off-topic thoughts and so on? So everyone's different. There's not going to be one like cure-all method here. You have to kind of do the work and figure yourself out. But if I, if I were to offer a couple suggestions, they would be, okay, a few things. One, so you're doing stuff that you're not that stoked about. It's not, it's not, it's clearly not engaging enough for you to care that much. But a few things help. One, have you identified why you're doing the thing? Because you should always know why you're doing an exercise, especially if it's a mundane, lame exercise. If someone just tells you you should do it and you just start doing it, I don't think it's gonna go anywhere productive, right? So. My advice to people is usually practice things you want to practice, that you're excited about practicing. But unfortunately, as with any skill, there's quite a lot of repetition of not the most exciting stuff that needs to happen in order to enable the cool stuff. But if you've identified that that's the cool stuff, what you are doing is just one of many steps to get to the cool stuff. It makes the doing the mundane stuff much more tolerable. You say, oh, well, yeah, this is lame, but then I'm going to be able to do that. So clear goal makes it, it just way easier to jump into, to commit to whatever needs to be done. So that's one sort of reframing thing. Uh, if you don't know why you're doing what you're doing and you can't really figure it out, it might be worth talking to a teacher that you respect 
and booking a lesson, that's a great use for a, a real in-person teacher is to say, I want to get here. I think I need to do these things, but I don't know, or they're not working, or maybe there's something else I need to do, or whatever. So that's a really good use for meeting someone face-to-face that you, that you respect and trust, and seeing if they have, if they can confirm that you're actually doing the right thing. Because if, if someone you trust says, you need to do this in order to do this, then you can sort of rest assured that you're not wasting your time. But if you're kind of guessing, like, I need to do this and maybe it'll make me do this, uh, that's a little, that's a little, that's not as inspiring practice wise. So that's one idea. Know why you're doing what you're doing. Um, Another thing is maybe what you're doing, if it's just so mind numbingly boring, isn't actually hard enough for you. Like, usually, like, very rarely am I actually doing something that is mindless. Yeah, never am I doing something that's mindless if I'm really practicing. So you kind of want to be on the edge of your comfort zone almost all the time. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Maybe you need to just elevate the difficulty of what you're doing and that will make, you'll have to focus because it's harder to keep track of what you're doing or the speed is at a, is at a speed where you, you, it's hard to do stuff. So if it's, if you're kind of on the edge of crashing, it should sort of focus your attention on the task at hand. That's one thing. There was a third thing that I was thinking. Let me see if I can think of what it was. Well, there's also like, yeah, there's also, and this kind of ties into the first one, but depending on what you're doing, um, you know, oh, no, 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 let's not go there. Third piece of advice is set a shorter period of time for you to focus on this. Um, I mean like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, the old Pomodoro method, which I think is like 20 minutes. They say that's how long you can intensely focus on something. So instead of telling yourself, oh, I need to work on pairs of beats for the next hour and a half, that is a daunting task for anyone. So maybe you just say, look, 20 minutes, laser focus at the edge of my comfort zone no breaks, no giving up. I start a, a stopwatch. When it hits 20 minutes, I take a break or I do some fun stuff or I change gears to something else. That's a good way to make some pretty sick progress and also focus your, your, your practicing. And maybe you do 20 minute chunk, five minute break, 20 minute chunk, five minute break, or 15 and five, 15 and five. Um, and then loop the ideas. You go A, B, C, A, B, C. That's a really effective uh, practice schedule I have found. So, that's, those are some ideas. Um, maybe they'll be helpful. But let me know if they are. All right. All right. This is a, a pretty cool question um, that I'm excited to get into. What goes on in your head when you're performing live, i.e. with Generation X? Are you thinking of the notes you're playing, the counting, the feeling of the song? How do you go about dealing with distractions? This is kind of similar to the other one. Um, like thinking about what you had for lunch, something you know Betancourt said before, a phone call you need to make, etc. Um, so, I actually, I thought this one through when I saw it, because this one really caught my attention, because I received the, the question when I was on or just finishing at Gen X. And on Gen X this year, I had been specifically trying to work on my mindset, since a lot of the music was, well, half the music was the same as the last tour, and I felt comfortable the tour was long enough to be very comfortable with the music after a week or two, a couple weeks. So naturally, my my focus shifted to my mindset. And I was trying a lot of stuff, just experimenting, because basically I was trying to, my goal was to just like be more at peace, be more calm, be just enjoying myself, less afraid to call back to my goal before, um, in general. So just, I want to, just be having the time of my life on stage. I have a great opportunity to just experience something that very few people get to experience. I should be enjoying it as much as I can. So that was my idea. Um, and I've, uh, over the years, sort of encountered many mindfulness things, but it's very strange to try to apply these things in the middle of like a show, because usually these are like sitting on a cushion, meditating kind of ideas, um, or like walking down the street ideas. So. Here are some ideas that I was experimenting with that I felt were 
effective to some degree. But what I did find is, and, and this is because I am by no means like a mindfulness guru, like just m- miles and miles away from even having some control of my thoughts. But these things I found helpful. And since I'm not a guru, I found I had to kind of shift from technique to technique, from show to show or within a show, try a couple of things. There wasn't one thing where I was like, that's it. Now I can just relax and play the show. Um, Here's a couple ideas. Now, the first one's maybe the weirdest one, especially if you're not uh, uh, hip to the meditation game, but uh, focusing gently on something. So there's this like, you can think of focus as like uh, a gradient where you've got super hyper focus, like you're way too focused, right? So you're playing, you're just thinking about every note you're playing to the point where it's, you're like overthink, it's that weird overthinking thing where you start messing things up that are super easy for you. So that's one extreme. The other extreme is just like, you're not even paying attention to what you're doing. Whatever comes out, comes out. Now, Gen Gen X is hard enough that I can't just let whatever come out, comes out, come out, because it would be wrong. So there's this middle ground and the the description that comes to me at least is gentle focus so and this is so mental it's such a mental game so this might or might not be helpful but it's something to try uh, when you're especially performing is to imagine that spectrum of hyper fo- hyper focused on something totally spacing out and then in the middle of somewhere where you're like you're seeing what's going on you're focused but you're consciously like uh mediating you're consciously managing your focus where you're like, okay, I'm getting a little hyper focused. Let's, let's not pay that much attention to that rhythm. Let's, you know, I'm spacing out a little bit. Let's focus in a little bit. So this is one idea, focusing gently on something. Um, number two, focusing on technique. This helped me a lot for several shows. Um, especially with the animals as leaders set, because it's the first set. It's the most complicated music. I'm the most nervous for that set. Um, and we'd get into it, and I found that stuff's very comfortable for me to play, actually. Um, so for that, I, I, I'd be, like, really in my head at the beginning of the show, and I, I couldn't... I was tr- trying many things to try to get out of that, but we just start the show, and I'd be anxious, and if I just focused on, like, relaxing, specifically my right hand and my left hand, just, like... Okay, like if I'm up here on the ride, I'm really thinking about being loose, like holding that stick, just like like Garska looks like he does, like he's just barely touching it and it's sort of floating there. And with the left hand, trying to really like not like push through the drum, let it kind of rebound, be relaxed. I got three hours of show ahead of me, so take my time. Focusing on technique really helped take the focus away from I'm gonna mess up or or what's this next complicated part. And again, it was a gentle focus. I'm not, I'm not thinking that hard. I'm not trying to feel every note as I play it. I'm just paying attention to my technique, which, may, which automatically will make you play with better technique. Um, paying attention to my technique, which takes the focus away from more negative aspects. So that's technique number two. Um, technique number three, go for 90%. And that might even be ambitious. So what I mean by that is, Uh, you might have heard this before, like what you do in the practice room is 100%. You're just never going to nail that on stage ever. So go, some people say like go for 60%. Um, 90% was just sort of a mentality shift where I was like, okay, I don't, I don't need to, I don't need to play everything perfectly, right? I don't need to play everything as loud as I can. I don't, it's okay to make mistakes, right? So I'm going for 90% A minus. And the sort of irony is you usually play better when you're shooting for 90% because you're putting less pressure on yourself to nail every note, right? I'm playing a three and a half hour show. There's probably literally like half a million notes in the show. Just like some percentage of those are gonna be just not perfect. And that's just gotta be okay. So you accept the 90% rule and something just kind of happens and you're like, oh, okay, well, let's let's take it a little easy. Let's relax a little bit. So that was... Another thing, number four, I would think that, so this is another thing. So a lot of drumming is automatic. So you are playing all sorts of stuff. You really can't think about everything that's happening. You're not thinking about 
the tech, you can think about the technique, but you're not sitting there going, okay, lift wrist, snap fingers, right? Every note for like, you know, a, a thousand notes. Um, you can't pay that close of attention. There's so much automaticity that you've already developed in playing the drums. So as all this is sort of happening automatically and you're sort of observing it, I tried to think of myself as sometimes as the manager, right? I'm the oversight. I'm watching the machine do what it knows how to do because it really does know, it knows what it needs to do. And I am the manager, so sometimes it, I, like my manager needs to step in and say, oh, we're rushing a little, ease it back. And then you just start watching again. You're watching for mistakes. You're watching for rushing and, and, uh, and dragging. You're watching for you having too much anxiety and getting too tight. Your manager says, yeah, loosen up. Pay attention to that technique. Or your manager says something else. And that sort of visualization kind of removes me from the, again, the intensity of getting lost in the in the fear of messing up. Um, so that's just another mentality shift that I found really cool. Uh, another thing, sing the songs while you're playing them. Uh, it's just a, another good distraction. Um, it takes a certain amount of focus to sing the songs, especially if they're like Animals as Leader songs. And that's just taking just enough focus. It's kind of automatic. You know, you can sing the songs without thinking very hard. Just automatic enough that for me it, it takes some of, again, that attention off of my anxiety of messing up. So the, another one, the sixth one here is visual focus. So sometimes, and this isn't what I would do for a prolonged amount of time, but sometimes this would be helpful when I kind of needed it. Now, for example, if I'm playing on the ride, I would fixate my vision on the wing nut of the ride. Or like, I don't even use wing nuts on the ride. It's just the, the stem of the thing of the symbol stand um, or pick a different wing nut or whatever I'd look at my wing nut on the splash symbol every now and then and you can even see it sort of move you'll you start to notice that it's sort of got its own like dance it's doing on this on the show or in the practice situation and you just put again gentle focus on it you're not like trying to figure out the symbol stand you're just yeah you know, gentle focus on the wing nut and you'll find that your body if you've if you, these are songs if you've memorized the song if you know the songs, if you can play the stuff, um, that helps you allow, get out of your own way and allow your body to play the stuff that it knows how to play. This is, I don't, I don't know if these are, are, these are really not applicable to like, if you just learned the music and you need to remember it for the first time. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like a normal show where you know what you're supposed to be doing and you're trying to like relax. Okay, I got two more for you. Number seven is this idea of things being kick drum driven. So sometimes, and I've mentioned this a lot before, uh, uh, drumming is very, is very balanced. Like your balance is essential in your drumming. <laughs> drumming is very balanced. So on stage, because everything's weird on stage, your mind's all weird, your balance gets weird, I'd find that I'd be like, uh, my balance would feel off. But I find that it would, it would sometimes fix it if I thought, okay, kick drum drum I put my focus gently on my kick drum and I'd be like all right the solid kick drum is driving what's going on now so it sort of reshifted my my weight physically to be more confident and powerful with my kick drum and since that's such a foundational element of so much of drumming it really I felt like a lot of the times it helped me just everything felt more solid. I felt more confident. I was literally putting more weight behind the kick drum, which sort of like had this confidence boosting feel. Um, that was just another idea. Focus, gentle focus on, on your kick drum being concrete. The last thing is learn to laugh at your mistakes. Uh, we take ourselves super seriously when we're on stage and we mess up and then we think about that mistake for like the rest of the show. We all do that, but this last tour I got, I was like, I laughed a lot every show. Like, you can ask anyone in the band. <clears throat> um, just, I'm learning to laugh at life, and the show is kind of ridiculous. It's just like, literally four hours of guitar onslaught. It's just a funny thing to be a part of. Uh, of course, it's all individually very cool, you know what I mean? But like, as a whole, you're like, this is, this is ridiculous. So... Yeah, and what's being asked of us is, like, totally ridiculous to play that long of a show with all these crazy dudes. So, like, when, you know, when I'd mess up, 
as long as I wasn't in like train wreck territory, I'd be like, you know, I'd look at the bass player and be like, just give, just have a laugh, you know what I mean? So that's an important. It's not really a skill you develop, but it's a habit. It's definitely a habit. I've also learned that like in public, when you do something dumb, the only way to not look dumb is to laugh at yourself. Like if if you, what would you do? Well, I do this to us stuff all the time. You can, you don't want to fake laugh. Just actually see the humor in it. Like. You sort of like turn around and like bump into something and drop a book or whatever you're carrying and you're like totally in public like if you're like oh jesus so, like you look like a total idiot and you feel like an idiot but if you like turn around and bump into some shit and you're just like Pfft, and you just kind of laugh it off see how dumb you probably look then other people are gonna be like oh that guy's got a good sense of humor and you yourself are not like not gonna feel like an idiot anymore so learn to laugh life's supposed to be fun Last question. This is a bit of a... I don't know if it's a long one, but... That was a long question. But I was, I'm excited about all that stuff. Try that stuff. Let me know what works and doesn't work. Because this is all stuff that, you know, I'm just trying in my head. And it's such a subjective thing. Because you have to just try it in your head. I'd be very curious to know if you find any of these ideas useful. The last thing. I noticed that you don't follow anyone on Instagram. Is there a specific reason for that? For example, not comparing yourself to others or to stop the overwhelming stream of information, etc. So yeah, that was just some, I landed from, I like, got on a trip home from like, Gen X. Yeah, it was Gen X in December. And I was at the airport and I was just like, I was like, I'm gonna unfollow everyone except my friends. Cause just, every time I get on Instagram, there's all this garbage I don't really care about. So I, I had been like, sort of, when I'd see someone and like, like unfollow it, but it was just like, I was still following like 500 people. So I started doing that and like the like it's just the number of people I wanted to keep following was so small when I started doing that that I was like before long I was like I'm just gonna try unfollow I'm gonna go through a cleanse I'm just gonna unfollow everyone except my own band Childish Shapes and you know just take a little time off Instagram and I just like didn't miss it at all like not at all I still it's been like three months and I'm just like cool well I definitely don't plan on using that again um, it's, yeah, it's just one of those things where for like years, I just, you're sort of habitually taking your phone out. It's just such a habit. It's like such a gross thing when you're like, as soon as like your friend, you're at like getting a drink with a, with a, with a, with one of the, one of the guys and you know, he's like somebody runs to the bathroom. You just like reflex. Your phone's out before you know your phone's out and Instagram's open before you know Instagram's open and you just checked it but you're looking at it again. It's like just this weird sort of pathetic thing about it objectively. And that just grosses me out and I just couldn't stop doing it. So I'm not very good at impulse control apparently. And I just, yeah, I just unfollowed everyone and it, it, it added, it just highlighted that like, oh, this adds no value to my life at all um, as, a, as, a, as a consumer. Obviously, I kind of need Instagram because that's how I let a lot of people know what's going on, um, be it drum camps or clinics or whatnot. So I'm sort of like, just like a selfish user right now where I post and I leave. I do check messages. If you, do, if you send me a message on Instagram, I'll probably see it. Um, but yeah, just, I'm just, uh, just, I don't miss it. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think, it's not that I, I think like, oh, my life is so much better. So I don't think about it. Like, so... It, take, it takes a couple of weeks to get used to it. But uh, yeah, I would highly recommend it. But if you do, join my email list so that you know what's going on in, my, in, in our world. Um, but yeah, that's it. Nothing special there. Um, I'm just trying to get, get further off that grid, man. Further off that grid. Give less, less authority to those algorithms controlling our lives. But I don't want to... Be kind of, I don't want to go full conspiracy theorist here. So before we go there, let's cut it off on AMA 9. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, I enjoy doing these. You guys have been sending some great questions, and I will keep trying to answer them in a useful way. So have a great week. I'll talk to you soon. But for now, patiently waiting to go again. I hold